Hey everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, September 2nd, 2018, for someone who is trying to do discreet surveillance on key members of Genoa City Society, Ray is certainly making himself very noticeable. Let the speculation begin. Ray Rosales, is he a mostly good guy? Or are we looking at a future bad guy here? YRChat.com, that's our poll question of the week and an open-ended question that I have for ya. Who is Ray working for or with? And now I'm talking about his day job here, the one where he is investigating JT, not the one where he's moonlighting as a plumber. <laughs> Oh yeah, all right, he fixed Sharon's plumbing this week, okay? <laughs> but of course, he left enough for Nick to do so that Nick could come in and finish the job. Ray just got Sharon's job started. He let Nick come in to finish her up. <laughs> I tell you what, Ray is doing a real good job of, of presenting himself as people would like to receive him. Um, you know, he comes to Sharon as someone who is rescuing, someone who can do a little rescue work shirtless. <laughs> that is speaking Sharon's language, I would say. I tell you what though, the, the closer that Ray gets to the truth, the more I do worry that Nick is gonna be the one to end up caught in the crosshairs. Ray uh, has been asking a lot of questions subtly around town. He is making an effort to start a relationship with Abby. And this is not only because she's a new man, but she's also Arturo's girlfriend. So Ray asks her to sit down with him under the guise of just wanting to get to know someone who has become very important in his brother's life. But Ray also manages to squeeze out of Abby what few little details she does know about JT. Specifically, Abby tells Ray that JT was not the one behind the Newman Enterprises hacking. So Ray, in reality, is only one degree away from finding out who was behind the Newman hacking, and that's Nick. By the way, I don't know if this is the best place to talk about this, but a quick little aside. Sharon pulls Phyllis aside this week to ask about Summer, where she's gone off to, she's off the map, and Sharon and Phyllis end up talking about Nick a little bit and his new personality and everything that happened with Victor and the JT impersonation, and Sharon realizes, hey, wait a minute, Nick told you about that? Uh, Nick's confiding in you now? But Sharon also didn't really pursue it. It was one of those things that I think Phyllis played it off immediately and so Sharon didn't have a reason to really go in on Phyllis about it, but I think that that's probably going to be one of those moments, that conversation with Phyllis right there, that Sharon realizes in retrospect was a big old red flag. So back to Ray and his uncanny ability to integrate himself into Genoa City society flawlessly, he walks right up to Abby 
when she's in the middle of having a Newman family dinner with Victor and Nikki and Victoria, and the way Ray approached her was as if they'd been friends forever. He's met her once, briefly, and then had one conversation with her later, and he just has this way of uh, carrying himself as if he just absolutely belongs there. He introduces himself to the family again, only this time he's, he's introducing himself as Arturo's brother, as Arturo's older brother. I think that Nikki did an, an internal spit take <laughs> when she heard that piece of information. Oh, wait a minute. This is Arturo's sexy older brother. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, Abby tried to smooth that over immediately so that no one would notice Nikki's reaction. Abby says, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Arturo did some work for Nikki's New Hope property. And Victor jumps in and says, yeah, it was a quick little project. <laughs> It was a quick, almost under his breath, it was a quick little project. Kind of, like a burn, too. I love that it was a quick little project. I felt that that was a, a burn from Victor toward Arturo. And Nikki just goes, yep, that was very professional. <laughs> Everything with me and Arturo, totally on the up and up. No hot secret sex going on there. Definitely not. Ooh. <laughs> oh, well. That meeting at the Newman family dinner table marked the second time in that same day when Victoria had an encounter with Ray. He made it so he could bump into her just a little bit earlier and now there he is standing at the dinner table and maybe in Victoria's mind two times could be a coincidence but three times is a pattern. Victoria starts to realize that this Ray guy is suddenly very, very friendly with all of the members of the Margarita Girls Night crew. Ray has gotten close to all of them, and Abby also casually mentions to Victoria that Ray was asking her questions about JT. So Victoria has her red flags up right away. The Margarita Girls crew meets to talk about what they think about this new guy. Nikki's trying to say, it's fine, it's not a big deal. Try not to worry, Victoria. You've got enough on your plate. But Sharon feels, I think, at this point that she has somewhat of a, enough of a casual relationship with Ray to just straight up ask him why he's in town. What are you up to? Why are you here? And without blinking an eye, Ray tells Sharon, I'm here because of J.T. Hellstrom. I'm a debt collector. Hmm. Somebody racked up all of those charges on JT's credit card uh, during the Newman Enterprises hacking, and it's just simply Ray's job to find out who that was. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? There's no way that Ray doesn't already know that JT wasn't using his own credit card, and I am pretty sure that Ray probably already knows that JT wasn't the one who hacked Newman Enterprises even without Abby having told him that. It almost sounds to me like the real target of Ray's investigation is not JT because all of the roads of information that he's following are going to lead to Nick. And who might be interested in getting revenge on Nick while finding out what happened to that no good JT Hellstrom at the same time? I don't know. Do I hear a mustache fluttering in the wind somewhere behind this? Hmm. Well, 
Sharon realizes that Victoria needs to have this information. If Ray is asking questions about JT and he's in town on a JT related project, Victoria has to know about it. And Victoria tells Sharon that what she needs to do is make it her mission, since she has the relationship with Ray, make it her mission to find out more. See if there's any more digging and any more information we can get out of this guy. Just invite him over to your house. Make him dinner. Guys go gaga over Sharon's meatloaf, apparently. <laughs> so, Ray comes over to Sharon's house while Nick isn't home, by the way. Hmm. <laughs> Did Sharon even tell Nick that Ray was coming over or did she just invite him? Just proactively invite him. I find that a little bit suspicious. Well, Mariah ends up showing up and joining them for dinner and they're all chatting at the table. Sharon trying to coax information about Ray's job out of him. Uh, all, tell me more about the exciting world of debt collecting. And while they're sitting there, Sharon gets a phone call from Ranch Security. There is an intruder on the property. Ray springs into action. He leaps up out of his seat, busts out a pistol from his belt buckle or wherever he had that thing hiding, somewhere down his pants, and he rushes out the door. Mariah and Sharon are crouched <laughs> over in the corner, not knowing what's going on, what the danger is. Ray <laughs> rushes back into the house just a few minutes later. He's caught the prowler, and it's Tessa. More on that later. Why is a debt collector carrying a loaded weapon to a friendly dinner get-together. Sharon questions him about the gun and he immediately makes up some excuse about not having any other place to put it because his hotel room doesn't have a safe and he didn't feel comfortable just leaving it in his hotel room. Hey Ray, how about you just leave it unloaded in the trunk of your car or something. What if it was Faith hanging around in the bushes outside of Sharon's house, creeping up, spying on her mom who's having <laughs> dinner with some handsome stranger while her dad isn't home? <sighs> the gun situation put an end to the friendly dinner right away. Ray <laughs> scoots on out of Sharon's house. Sharon calls Victoria to let her know that this guy is carrying a gun. But Vic Victoria doesn't get that message right away because she's too busy sitting there in her office alone at night with Ray. He went right from Sharon's house to Victoria's office to apologize. I, I, Again, he presents himself as having known you forever. He's standing there in Victoria's office, having only met this woman once. I mean, he's bumped into her a couple times, but really only met her once. And he's pulling a Dr. Nate on her, getting all up in her business, going on about how stressed she is. It must be so hard to run this Newman Enterprises company after all that hacking business. Plus, of course, you have your family and, you know, everything that went on with JT. Everybody knows about that. Well, <laughs> Victoria smartly calls his bluff. I loved this moment from Victoria. She busts out her cute little red checkbook and she says to Ray, okay, okay, if you're a debt collector, give me a figure. Tell me exactly how much money it's going to take to pay off these debts of JT's. I'll write you the check and you can be on your way. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, that wouldn't be good enough for Ray, okay? He, he has to do a real 
thorough job for his employer. He can't, it's not just his job to recover the money. No, no, no. He needs the information. He needs to take the information back to his boss to tell his boss who it was that racked up those charges. Uh-huh. Well, Ray leaves Victoria's office real quick after she called that bluff, and he's out in the hallway making a mysterious phone call to someone saying, yeah, I found Victoria in her office. She bought it. <laughs> Number one, somebody told Ray where to find Victoria. And number two, somebody is helping him to craft his cover story. So again, I ask, who is Ray working for or with? And I think it's Victor. I think that Victor hired Ray to do this digging, thinking that Ray is going to start to peel away the layers on this whole thing, find some inc incriminating evidence on Nick, find out where the heck JT Hellstrom went off to, and in the end, I think Victor's going to discover that the incriminating evidence he's finding is going to be all about his wife and his daughter. Nikki finally got Victoria to break down and talk about what's really been going on with her. It was such a mom move <laughs> to... Victoria was so stressed this week that she was not able to focus on the magical fairy woodland bridal shower that Sharon's bridesmaids are planning for her, which I really hope we get to see. <laughs> Victoria jets out of that planning meeting and then uh, later tells Nikki that, oh, she doesn't have time for anything or to talk to her because she's on her way to her therapist's appointment. Well, Nikki follows Victoria, realizes she wasn't going to a therapist's appointment. She went straight home. And so Nikki just follows her, walks on into Victoria's house, walks upstairs to Victoria's bedroom where Victoria's taking a nap, crawls right into bed next to her and is sitting there when she wakes up. Leave it to a mom to force those answers out of you, huh? <laughs> I actually really loved that. Last week, I know I was wishing that everybody would just leave Victoria alone and let her deal with her own life, but I have to tip my hat to Nikki for knowing that there wasn't something right, something wasn't right with her daughter, and forget about the whole Nate route. Talk to her directly. Keep trying until you get uh, some answers and, and ultimately forcing her to confront what's really going on in her mind. And it was a great, really great conversation of the mom and daughter just sitting there and lying there in bed. And Nikki was able to get Victoria to admit that she had stopped seeing her therapist. You know, we were under the impression last week that she was still going to counseling, but Victoria admits to Nikki this week that it was all just too painful. Every time she goes to the doctor, she just ends up dredging up all of these memories about JT and the abuse and everything she went through. It's just like reliving it over and over again. And Victoria believes that sometimes talking about it isn't the answer. Maybe sometimes the answer is simply to take your mind off of your trouble for a little while at least. Victoria seemed very relaxed when she was just having drinks and playfulness with Billy. That seemed really to cheer her up this week and I laughed when Billy showed up in her office because they were planning to meet to talk about the kids. And she shows up after him, and he's sitting there at her desk with paper and markers, and he's coloring outside of the lines, and she's reprimanding him for that. It was adorable. Those two, I, I'm not sure if 
they're gonna end up back together at the end of this. I, I don't think I'm necessarily ready for that or looking forward to that, but I think the dynamic between Billy and Victoria is very effective. That, that's always kind of been the appeal of them. They're a little bit of the odd couple. They're just so opposite that something about it works. And maybe Billy could be a friend for her. Just someone who, I mean, Victoria doesn't have a lot of girlfriends necessarily, but maybe Billy could be someone to help her through what she is going through. I don't know that I'm really zeroing in on Victoria having a relationship very much right now because I do think that she needs to focus on herself after what she's been through. She's got some post-traumatic stress going on, no doubt about it, and it's something that needs to be addressed personally before or she would ever be in a position to get into a relationship again. Last week, I asked you guys if you felt that Victoria should accept Nate's offer to help relieve her stress. The majority of you said, no, 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 back off, Nate. <laughs> I mean, I, I, t I voted no also. I was definitely on the annoyed with Nate last week. 39% um, of you, though, were feeling it. I think the, those of you who were feeling it are probably going to get your wish, ultimately. Because as soon as Ray leaves Victoria's office, she has a full-on panic attack. She cannot breathe, she's got blurry vision, she's got a rapid heartbeat. And so who does she call? Uh, folks, just a PSA here, just a, just a moment to, to inject some reality here. If you ever can't breathe, just call 911. I don't care if your family doctor does live right down the street and he's willing to run to the office to save you. Call 911. But this isn't reality. This is soap opera land and the idea <laughs> of Nate booking it down the street as fast as he can in that hot fit bod to go rescue Victoria is, it's a little bit charming, okay. <laughs> And then Nate, when he gets to Victoria's office, doesn't call for backup help, doesn't decide to call the paramedics. No, he just takes Victoria back to Neil's condo so that he can exam her. I'm LOLing on the inside at the idea that number one, Neil's condo has become the location for Nate's medical practice. And number two, Nate was probably examining Victoria with the same stethoscope that he examined Hillary with in the middle of the night, only this time he actually had his shirt on for Victoria's exam. Shirt on. <laughs> but he still he couldn't stop himself from feeling all of this compassion for her. She's been nothing but cold to him and yet as he's examining her and talking to her about the fact that she has just had a panic attack he can't stop himself from also just giving her a hug you know i think gen genuinely nate is a nice good person who wants to help people that's probably why he became a doctor he's he seems like he's a good person and for some reason he feels connected to Victoria and he wants to reach out and help her whether she is going to accept the help or not. It wasn't a bad scene. It was a little bit of a, a, a fantasy <laughs> to think that that's what would actually take place, but I liked their conversation. Um, she was only able to allow herself to open up a certain amount. I think that it, Victoria knows if she lets the full truth out with anyone, then she's in real deep danger. So even as she was talking to him, you could feel that she was closing off and she ultimately did run upstairs and try to play the whole thing off, refused any further counseling. She just closed herself right back up to where she was a couple of hours, a couple of days before. But I still, I thought it was, it was hopeful. 
I do think that Nate actually had some really inf interesting information about fear and trauma and nightmares um, and the reason behind them that I found really interesting. I just, when he was saying that about fear and trauma and nightmares, I just kept wondering why Nate is not putting as much effort or really a whole lot of effort into offering his cousin Lily some counseling. Lily's gonna really need it. Lily opens up to Abby this week and tells her she's worried she will not survive prison if she's sentenced to actual hard time. And I'm sure that Lily really feels that way. For someone like Lily, who's going from the lap of luxury, a wonderful lifestyle, to the confinement and the society of a prison has got to be terrifying. I would be terrified. I mean, Lily has been raised in riches and affluence and none of that is gonna save her now. All week we had the parade of people visiting Devon pleading Lily's case, in effect, pleading with him to just choose to forgive his sister, but all Devon can focus on is Hillary's case. Devon is committed to making sure that some sort of justice is done on Hillary's behalf. Devon believes, and I think this was a great point, that if no one goes punished, if no one gets punished for what happened to Hillary, then it becomes a complete disservice to her life and to the life of his child and to both of their memories. My favorite discussion of the week was the debate between Devon and Nate. I mean, they were essentially having the same debate that we were having two weeks ago about justice versus revenge. And Devon made a really good point that if a stranger had done this to Hillary, you can pretty well bet that everyone in the Winders family would be encouraging him to go through with wanting the maximum punishment for the person. No doubt about it. But it's also, I think, impossible to ignore the larger picture of what this will do to the family. And Devon this week also did admit that he really hasn't conceptualized what his testimony or what Lily's sentence could potentially do to the family or to the children. All Devon can see is his loyalty and his obligation and his commitment to his family even if they're no longer here. Um, but I think that Devon is gonna turn around and surprise us next week. All, Cause all of the signs are pointing to Devon walking into Lily's sentencing next week, delivering a statement that will eviscerate her, that will state to the judge that he believes she should receive 20 years in prison for this crime. Um, but I think at the very last minute, that Devon is going to have that emotional component kick in and I think he is going to have compassion for his sister. I think that's maybe the last step in his evolution of acceptance. I can just see him maybe going in with guns ablazing and then coming to the conclusion that he doesn't want to do this to his sister. Ultimately, though, the judge is going to be the one who determines what happens to Lily, not Devon or anyone in the family or anyone else. Wow, some really big casting news that's going to affect this storyline is Crystal Khalil, who plays Lily, is going to change uh, to recurring status. She's no longer going to be a full-time contract player. So, I mean, it's hard to ignore that going into next week and speculating about the hearings outcome. If, if Lily's going to be on recurring status, 
Does this mean that there's going to be at least some prison time for Lily? If so, I just would be so surprised. I mean, does that mean that every time we see Lily for the next year or a couple years or however long, she's going to be in a jail cell? I can't imagine another way that they would write the story to keep her on recurring. I mean, I don't know. I think that it's possible. If, if I didn't <laughs> hear this news, I would be going into next week thinking they're not going to give Lily prison time. She's going to get probation. It's going to be fine. But now knowing this, I wonder if what we're going to see, and this is just purely my speculation, I think that Devon's going to go into that courtroom and he is going to decide to phrase his statement in a way that tells the judge how much Hillary meant and that conveys his pain, but that does not directly implicate or indicate that he wants Lily to receive a maximum sentence. I think he's going to pull back in the courtroom and maybe the judge is going to say, yep, thanks, 20 years. Anyway, I think that would be a way to absolve Devon from having influenced the court's decision uh, while still leaving a gap for the actress to go off on recurring. And if that's the case, if Lily does go to prison, I wonder how Devon will actually feel if that's the outcome. Hmm. I mean, there's just no, it, none of it brings Hillary back. That's the sad truth. I felt awful for Devon this week as Lily and Kane were out on the town trying to enjoy their last night together. If the sentencing hearing is tomorrow, then whatever punishment Lily gets, it's gonna take effect immediately. So Lily and Kane try their very best to spend their last moments together making it count. And Devon happens to see them and it could look to him as if they were callously out having a blast, toasting drinks and enjoying a meal and a date under the stars while Devon's wife has been cruelly taken from him. In a way, I wonder if seeing Kane and Lily out like that it just might be the thing that changes Devon's tone a little bit. Like, the love of his life, Hillary, was taken from him. His child was taken from him. So why would he want to inflict that pain on anyone else? Why, you know, what, what would be the benefit of making Lily suffer? Oh, by the way. Of all people, Victor Newman also sat down with Devon to chat with him about the situation this week. We had the parade of people and Victor, of all people, had to jump in on that. Victor thinks that he knows a thing or two about family betrayal and he is plenty happy to use this as an opportunity to tell anyone and everyone who will listen about what Nick did to him. I was stunned at Victor for talking to Devon, and yes, he said some things that were supportive, but I was stunned with Victor for finding a way to make it about himself. <laughs> and there again, that tells me that Victor is just lying in wait for his opportunity to get back at Nick. Justice and revenge are one and the same when you're Victor Newman. I love the idea that right this very moment, Summer Newman is circling the Great Lakes on a private yacht right now with no Wi-Fi, no cell phone reception. Did Phyllis orchestrate that too? <laughs> Summer has, she's just off the map. She's off the grid right now while Phyllis plots her next move. So as soon as Billy gets back from his business trip, Phyllis tells Billy all about Summer's plan for Philly and how she worked that text message magic to lure Summer to the yacht on his behalf and then she asks him why would Summer think so easily that you sent that text message to her? 
what is going on between you and my daughter? Just be direct about it, fellas. There's no more time for skirting around the issue. She just says, what is going on between you and my daughter? And I think that Phyllis had every right to ask that question, of course, but for Billy, that question reinforced all of his deepest, darkest fears about himself. Phyllis doesn't trust me, and maybe she's right to not trust me. Maybe I am the perpetual screw up, always destined to make the wrong decision. Maybe I should just do everyone I care about a favor and just get out of their lives. Billy tries packing a bag and tries to leave Phyllis. And Phyllis convinces him to stay. She believes him. She believes in him. She doesn't want to be seen as someone who is unsupportive. She doesn't want her deepest, darkest fears about herself, i.e. what Summer said about her, to be true. So Phyllis forgives Billy and they make love. <laughs> but Phyllis issues a very haunting warning to Billy. She lets him know that, I be don't get me wrong, I believe you, but if you ever did screw around with my daughter, I'd kill you. And the look on her face when they zoomed in on it, she meant it. That looks like a woman who meant it. I really hope that that's not going to be um, a preview. I hope that's not foreshadowing of something that Billy's gonna do. Ugh. Well, I mean, they are making the right decision for themselves now, from now on. Now that the truth is out there, should have been out there before, they're deciding to move on. At the crack of dawn, Billy and Phyllis show up at the Abbott Mansion doorstep, bags packed, moving out of that apartment, moving away from that mess, let Ashley know that they're going to be moving on in. Hey, you know what? Billy has every right to be there just as much as anyone else. I totally support him being there. The, as soon as I realized that was his plan, I was like, yes, yes, let's get Billy into that house. But for Phyllis, it's out of the frying pan and into the fire because now Phyllis is putting some distance between herself and her little brat of a daughter. But Phyllis is also moving back into the home that she shared with her ex-husband, Jack. And I think Billy is picking up on that a little bit. There was just a, a moment, a couple of moments where it seemed like Billy was watching Phyllis be extra concerned about Jack. And I wonder if Billy is a little bit insecure about that. Billy just doesn't know that the person he needs to be insecure about is Nick. She didn't go sleeping with Jack when she found out that Billy was gambling again. Oh no, she went sleeping with Nick. Well, the Abbott house is gonna be a tough place to live. Not only is it getting a little crowded, but it also has the element of Dina. Dina's bumbling around the mansion, getting worse and worse. Even Phyllis and Billy notice that she's worse than just a few months ago, worse than the last time they saw her. She's collecting table scraps for a dog that she doesn't have. She, you know, Dina is more and more not bec not being recognizable and she's not recognizing people she is really lost on her timeline i mean she did have a dog but it was during the roosevelt administration really really painful to watch and i it's it's not getting any better jack realizes that he's just been almost in a submersion tank when it comes to Dina. He's been so close to the situation that maybe he hasn't seen how bad it's become and how much she's deteriorated. I wonder if Jack is going to be realizing 
that Dina's condition has deteriorated so badly that he's going to have to move back into the Abbott Mansion to take care of her. I wonder if Jack is going to end up rooming right next door to Billy and Phyllis. Hmm. Or, or maybe also moving back into the mansion so that he continue to, can continue to mine Dina for information. The previews of next week's show, it looks like we're back on the trail of finding who Jack's real daddy is. Okay, fine. We have another picture. <laughs> we have another picture and more questions. Just, just tell me who it is, Mal. Just tell me. Who Jack's father is? Is it John Abbott? Is it Philip Chancellor? Is it Victor Newman? Is it the milkman? Ashley wants Billy out of that house and out of the company too. The front door to both of those buildings would be revolving if it were up to her. Billy made it clear to Ashley this week, putting her in check and letting her know that he's planning to move forward with Jabotique with or without her blessing. She needs to get on board or just get along. But he also clues her into the fact that he's getting money from some unknown place to launch the Jabotique project ahead of schedule. So Ashley's worried about that. Not only has he stripped away her R&D budget, but there's also some magic money coming from somewhere. Now she's been off in the corner plotting with Kyle, entertaining his idea to just do a frame up job on Billy to speed the whole thing up. I mean, they already know that he almost lost <laughs> Jabot a company yacht, a very expensive company yacht, in a poker game, not professional, and a major freaking problem if your CEO is doing that. But the idea that they should just stage an opportunity to trap him and make him do it again or lure him into taking to doing it again, it's it's real shady. In in Kyle's mind, Kyle being the one who suggests it. It, you know, Billy already has a pattern of behavior of doing these reckless things. We're just helping the process along. And as soon as the board sees that, they're not going to want to ignore it. Ashley's not as keen on the idea. Ashley's been listening to Kyle, and I think she's been entertaining Kyle. But she also makes it clear to him this week that she doesn't think it's right to use Billy's gambling addiction against him. Kyle wants to set up a kind of like a fake poker game and end up, t you know, luring Billy into it and taking his money. And Ashley says, I don't think you realize how serious the gambling addiction is. Your father has an addiction and I would think that maybe you would be a little bit more sensitive to that. Ashley certainly wants Billy out of the company, but she doesn't really want to hurt her brother. She just wants him out of the way is all. Kyle doesn't have these qualms. Kyle is jealous of Billy for two reasons. Number one, Billy has all of Summer's attention. And number two, Billy has the CEO position that Kyle wanted for himself. So Kyle arranges a meeting with Sinead, <laughs> Billy's poker rival with the alternative lifestyle pink haircut. <laughs> and Kyle gives Sinead a big old envelope full of cash, a move which, by the way, he undoubtedly learned from Victor Newman. And he has told Sinead that she needs to lure Billy the Gladiator Abbott. <laughs> Twice in two weeks, Billy's a freaking gladiator at the poker table. She needs to lure the gladiator into a high stakes poker game wipe him out of his money and then Kyle will wipe out her debts in return. Where's Kyle getting all of this money? 
by the way. Last week he was paying for Mariah's private investigator, um, and he happens to have enough money to wipe out somebody's gambling debt. Kyle is an enigma. He really truly does have some layers. I think this is a good instance of Kyle doing something good and then doing something bad. Then good, then bad. Then good, then bad. Last week he's helping to use his wealth uh, to help Mariah hire the PI and then this week he's using his wealth to entrap Billy. Maybe I'm just in deep mom mode this week, but I was kind of feeling Sharon's reaction to Tessa coming back into town. <sighs> Trouble seems to follow this girl everywhere she goes, and I'm not so sure that I would really want Tessa dating my daughter or my son for that matter. Look at it purely from a parental perspective for just a minute. The girl is involved with your son. She wasn't completely honest with him. Then she's involved with your daughter, wasn't completely honest with her either. She, The girl splits town, absolutely disappears off the face of the planet, leaves your daughter in agony, does not communicate with her in any way, and then returns to town needing money. Look, I was, I was not on board with Sharon early in the week when she was suggesting to Mariah that maybe Tessa was staying away on purpose. That's probably something that I wouldn't have said to Mariah, uh, but I also kind of understand that maybe Mar Sharon's watching Mariah thinking she's holding on to some false hope when Tessa doesn't want to be found. That maybe this is just what Tessa does. She avoids hard decisions and she didn't want to have to face turning you down so she just disappeared. But then Mariah also had Kyle in her ear being the friend and helping Mariah remember the very last night that she saw Tessa and saying that Tessa normally, or that, that Mariah normally does a really good job of reading people and that if Tessa were lying to her or manipulating her in any way, then Mariah would have sensed it. Mariah wants to trust her gut here. She wants to believe in Tessa. So when Tessa showed up at the ranch, as soon as Ray put his gun away, Mariah was relieved while Sharon was standing there annoyed, like with crossed arms, hands on hips, looking at Tessa real suspect. I mean, I think that Mariah just felt happy that Tessa was alive and safe and standing here in her living room while Sharon started pressing Tessa for answers to the hard questions right away. And I was like, you go Sharon, get those answers. Why did you leave Mariah hanging? Why couldn't you have just contacted her by using a prepaid phone or something? Send a postcard, something. Tessa admits to Sharon and to Mariah that she didn't do a real good job of communicating during this time, but she did tell Mariah before she left, look, if you don't hear from me, don't worry, I'm doing my own thing. And Tessa also says the situation was dangerous. She had to get her sister out of the country. She had to give her sister a new identity, a new job, a new life. Not an easy task. It was dangerous and she didn't want to endanger Mariah. That was important to her. Part of this plan, part of everything even before Tessa left was, you can't go with me. I don't want to involve you in this. I just want you to be safe. <sighs> Tessa had to work with some dangerous people in order to help her sister. Apparently, the guys who helped her smuggle Crystal out of the country completed the job, and then when all was said and done, demanded $20,000 from her. 
was Tessa surprised? First of all, did Tessa think that this was free? <laughs> did Tessa think she was getting involved with these guys and they were just going to help her out of the kindness of her heart for illegal activities? No, they wanted $20,000. Apparently she didn't ask and they didn't tell until after the job was done. And so now she's back in town only being allowed to come to Genoa City to see if she could pull the money together. Okay. Wait, hold up. So, first of all, right now, the bad guys know where Tessa is. They know she's in Genoa City specifically to get their money. What was that she was saying about not wanting to endanger Mariah? And now the bad guys know exactly where she is and probably who she's sitting there talking to. Okay, number two, how exactly did Tessa think that she was going to make $20,000 materialize by coming back to Genoa City? She's going to have to do a lot of gigs and take a lot of tips to come up with that kind of cash. Gee, I don't suppose that it even occurred to Tessa that her new girlfriend is connected to the billionaire Newman family, right? Right? Nah, probably not. She came back to town for Mariah. Definitely didn't have anything to do with the fact that she's now got a $20,000 debt to some really bad guys who know exactly where she is and where her sister is. Oh, oh, Mariah, you think you... You might be able to help me come up with that 20 grand? Oh, well, I never would have thought of that. You're superhero material. That was our quote from last week. It was Sharon who said that to Ray after he changed Phyllis's flat tire. Oh yeah, he's super mater superhero material. All right. He turned around, fixed her plumbing too. I mean, this guy. That's why I'm really interested in seeing the poll results for this week. Because I think it could still go either way. I mean, just because Ray is investigating doesn't mean he's necessarily got a nefarious motive. I think there's a couple different ways we could go with this. He could be a superhero or he could be a supervillain. But either way, 11 of you guessed that that quote came from Sharon. So... Way to go, Tina Cole, Heather, Michelle, Ambreen, Henry, Susan, Cece, Juanita, Tanya, Liz, and Diana. Well done. Here's a moment from the last week's show. Who said this? Poof, like magic, I'm gone. <laughs> Poof, like magic, I'm gone. If you think you know who said it, you can go to yrchat.com and leave your guess. If you get it right, next week, one of those shout outs is yours. I am definitely not the only YNR chatter this week who had an eyebrow raised at Tessa this week. Diana says, Tessa not answering Mariah's texts is inexcusable. There isn't a reason for her not to have sent a text saying that she was fine. Sharon mentioned that maybe Tessa didn't receive any messages, but Tessa never said she didn't. Yeah, so uh, if Tessa was able to use that phone to talk with Mariah at all, then why wasn't she able to return the messages? What made the difference of a week using that same phone? It, it just doesn't sit right with me. It, it, this is the thing. If T Tessa... She is either a victim of not great writing or is starting to just look kind of like a troublemaker that's maybe not worthy of Mariah. I need somebody to give me Tessa's perspective. I'm in a constant state of struggling with this. And I think so is Laura. Laura says the direction should be Tessa supporting Mariah. Tessa is like one of those energy sucking, all lives revolve around them people 
that we kicked out of our lives in our mid-20s, the smarter chatters among us shut them out right away. I totally and completely am agreeing with you right there, Laura. If YNR wanted us to want this couple, they should know Mariah is our main character. This actress has been on the show for 20 years, you know, and of course there have been gaps or anything. The viewer is going to feel more connected to the character of Mariah, who they've known since a child, than uh, the character that's coming in out of nowhere. So you are right that the dynamic in making us want this couple should be that Tessa is there helping Mariah, not constantly asking of Mariah. Laura also says the four women should just frame Crystal for JT's murder. <laughs> Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> Laura also says, uh, Ray Rosales, topless within a week of arrival in Genoa City. He know how the game is played. <laughs> oh, man, Laura, you are funny. You're funnier than me, I think. Um, and I tend to think I'm pretty funny. <laughs> Let's talk uh, talk about Ray here with Lisa because this is a really, really smart point. Lisa says, why would YNR bring in Ray to investigate JT's disappearance when we have an excellent detective in the chief of police, Paul Williams? I love it when soaps use their existing characters to generate avenues of stories. I am sure Ray is a great actor. We know that Ray is there to give a background story for Arturo and the family connection. But what if Ray is Summer's old lover from before she came back to town? I remember Summer mentioning stealing her Latin lover's car and his wife finding out. Summer called him Pablo, but he, Ray, could have lied about his name. Ray told Sharon he and his wife were on a break. Maybe YNR wants to do a love triangle between Summer, Ray, and Kyle or Billy. Mmm. Lisa, first of all, I agree about Paul. I mean, why is he, why isn't, I mean, I guess they gave him his chance, but it was real half-hearted. Paul had his chance to investigate this whole thing. He definitely failed. But that's only because the writers decided. Are, are we going to see Paul next week, considering that, Christine is coming back to prosecute Lily, presumably. Yeah, it is curious that Paul has fallen off the canvas. And it's also worth noting that I believe Doug Davidson is the longest r running cast member. I believe he's been on YNR longer than anyone else on the canvas. Uh, I believe Melody Thomas Scott being second. So why are they not using their most senior character at all? It's a legitimate question. Also, I love that you brought back up the fact that Ray was supposedly married, but taking a break from his wife and connecting it into Summer. I never would have made that connection. I didn't even fully conceptualize what was the reason we were being told that Ray was on a break from his wife, but that could be really good. I thought it was purely just to make both Sharon and Ray kind of involved with someone else so that Wayanar can eventually hook them up in the future probably uh, after things with her and Nick go haywire. I don't want them to but I'm just waiting for Sharon and Nick to end up being torn apart once again and she and Ray could could be hot. I mean there's a million different people we could pair Ray with. Probably at the end of the day, that's why Wynar's choosing Ray over Paul, because Paul is not Mr. Shirtless anymore. I mean, he had his day. I think we saw Doug Davidson's butt on Wynar at a certain point back in the 90s, but that's not exactly his role anymore, and I think they maybe brought on Ray to give us some <laughs> Hunky man. <laughs> um, let's move into Nate and Victoria here. Marion says, I loved it when Nate showed up at Victoria's office. It was like he flew in to rescue her. And what about when he instinctively took her in to, co to comfort her? That was so cute and romantic. He's quite a gentleman, Nate, for a 26-year-old lad. 
the 10 year gap between them is an issue for me personally, so I'm just gonna have to pretend that I know nothing about it. <gasps> really, Marion, you it bothers you that Nate's younger than Victoria? <laughs> I, that didn't even occur to me. I mean, we've got the gap between the characters, but I mean, I, I guess, I don't think they look like there's that much of an age difference between them. And I guess I didn't really even think about the fact that he's 26. You must have Googled that. Because <laughs> uh, it would have to be the actor's age, right? Ooh, I gotta look into that. But I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, Still thinking that Victoria and Nate could happen over time. I think that's what YNR wants us to, to feel. We'll just see. Uh, but Kara says about the character uh, gap, for a split second I tried, but I can't wrap my mind around anything romantically between Victoria and Nate because she was probably already divorced from Ryan when Nate was in preschool. <laughs> I've always wanted to see her get back or get with Jack, Kara says. I know he was her stepdad, but I've always wanted that to happen and it just hasn't. Still hoping. Maybe is the 10 year gap, is that what Marion's referring to? The fact that the characters are so different in age? Maybe so. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, I mean that doesn't the the character. I'm I'm able to move past that only because I feel like I have to. But Victoria and Jack, that's an interesting concept because it does seem like occasionally YNR will show Victoria and Jack having some kind of interaction. And I get you, the stepdad thing would definitely be weird. But it almost does seem like every once in a while. YNR has a scene between those two that makes you wonder if they've got it in their plans. Oh, you know that would tick off Victor. I'm surprised they haven't. <clears throat> Mary Ann says that she would much prefer um, that Nate were a match with Summer. He and Victoria would be too self-assured professional people who take themselves very seriously. Summer would at least make him laugh and she could uh, use some of his talks. <laughs> yeah, she might need some. If anybody on this show needs some of that Nate Hastings Jr.'s advice, Lil Nate advice, it would be Summer. Also, Marianne left a really nice comment about how she found YNR chat initially, and I really appreciated that comment. It was lovely to read, um, and also was speculating on the next five years at YNR and hoping that the show continues in somewhat of an upbeat direction. Yeah, I, I don't like it when the show gets too dark either. <clears throat> Lynn says, I really enjoyed the scenes with Devon this week. I applauded when he told Nate that he was tired of people telling him how to feel. I'm liking how the writers are showing the pain and hurt uh, of Devon's feelings losing his wife, Hillary, and his child. And I can relate to that too, Laura. I mean, yeah, I don't like anybody telling me how to feel or what to say. So yeah, I mean, I get it. And Zuperplex says, I don't care what others' opinions might be, but Lily's ir irresponsibility leading to the death of Hillary deserves prison time. Well, I mean, I think I that's definitely um, legitimate. <laughs> if it is a crime that comes with a potential punishment of prison time, then it's certainly legitimate to think that that might be the appropriate punishment for her. I think I just tend to, especially, I don't know, right now I think I am only trying to think of it in terms of, like, what what really is the value of sending this person to prison? Um, and it, it just doesn't seem to really change anything. But anyway, we already talked about all that last week. But I get it. You know, I get it. I think that's why, um, it's kind of why courts exist, right? <laughs> you know, we, it's to, to mediate the different uh, opinions, right? Um, Jamie says, what's missing from this Lily storyline for me is I want to see someone express their disappointment in her and hold her accountable, not just Devon. So yeah, Jamie, I can see Devon's point of view that Lily is coming off as getting a free pass simply because she's Lily, especially as 
everyone in his life is approaching him mostly to tell him to have some compassion for Lily. And there's not one other person that aside, aside from maybe Shauna who's really on Devon's side. It's created this world versus Devon uh, situation. And I think you're right that maybe there does need to be someone else there who is expressing to Lily that she has done something wrong and um, and maybe helping to counsel her way out of it. Um, and, and not just Shauna either. It's really, it's really just Devon and Shauna versus the world. Gina had left a comment saying that she was not feeling the actress who was playing Shauna. Feels that she's not really delivering the role. I kind of agree with you, Gina. I wasn't feeling much connected even to the fact that Charlie and Shauna got back together this week. I mean, I, I was connecting in with what the character was feeling the week that Hillary Hillary died, but for some reason, maybe it was just the gap of time. Lionheart didn't put much effort into Shauna, and then she just comes back and is magically reunited with Charlie. It just wasn't doing anything for me. I mean, the actress herself doesn't bother me, but the the reunion this week just kind of meh. I wonder if Lionheart is gonna keep her around beyond this trial next week. I just am not sure. Liz says, the search for Jack's father gave us a rabbit hole to explore over the summer, as well as gave Peter Bergman some meaty material to work with, but can we please return things to their natural order? <laughs> yeah, I hope they wrap this up. You know that's how I feel. I'm, I'm sure that they're bringing it up now because we're getting ready, as I said last week, to we're going to work Jack back into Jabot one way or another. I have a feeling that this is all just going to be connected in to the Blood Abbott Clause. Maybe at the end of this, we're just going to find that John Abbott was Jack's father all along and we can just sweep this on away. That's my hope anyway. Really good cause, series of comments here from Ellen saying, I want Billy to come out on top at Jabot. Ashley and Jack are so sure that he has not done his homework, that he's taken too many risks, that their old school ways are the only way. I want Billy to succeed all expectations with Jabotique. The last thing I want is Fuddy Duddy Jack or Trader Ashley in charge. Billy is a leader for the 21st century. He can stay away from gambling and find a loyal executive team. Phyllis and maybe somebody else would be great. And Kyle is good as a next generation challenge. He'll keep Billy on his toes. Ellen, I, I think that I would in general, I think I'd like to see Billy succeed too. I feel like Jack will ultimately get back into the company, but that is something we've seen. I mean, Jack's been the head of Jabot for a really long time. We've had all that drama. I am also, in the Jabotique way, kind of rooting for Billy. Now, the fact that he did gamble away that company yacht is a problem, but it's also not as if Jack wasn't like drinking and doing pills when he was at the home of Jabot. It's not like Jack has never put Jabot at risk for his personal vendetta with Victor. So I don't think that Billy is doing anything all that much different or worse from Jack in general. I want to support Billy too. And he, aside from the, the gambling is the only thing he really did that disappointed me. Um, Ellen says also, OMG, it actually happened. With my own ears, I heard Billy List leaving Delia alone in that car the night she died among his greatest regrets. If only he had added that Adam should never have been blamed for her death, then I might have fainted. Good job, Billy. I'm glad you take responsibility for your tragic mistake. Not much else you can do, sadly. So this is a really well-rounded comment from Ellen because, you, you know, you, you want to see Billy succeed and yet acknowledging that he has something really dark in his past that, w that was a, a huge mistake. Um, I think that's really, really interesting. Um, 
And yeah, I was surprised that Billy mentioned that about Delia too. It sure was a moment. Billy went on a rampage after that happened and he certainly didn't want to believe that he could have done something that would hurt his own child and a lot of the attention did get put on to Adam. Yeah, that was tragic. I, I hope we don't go, I don't want to go back to storylines like that. That was one of the darkest periods of YNR that I can remember. Ugh, never again, please. Well, hey, I got a couple of comments from chatters this week listing other examples of mother-daughter triangles. Uh, so we've been dealing with Summer and Phyllis and Billy, but this is definitely not the first time we've forayed here. Gary mentioned the time that Dina went after Ashley's beau, Eric Garrison. Now, I wasn't watching at that time, so I don't know the specifics of that one, but we all know Dina was a little bit of a hussy, and I had heard <laughs> that she had gone after uh, some of Ashley's boyfriends. So that's a really good one. I thought I'd toss that out there also for the YNR chatters who were watching at the time. A little flashback for you, Eric Garrison from Gary. And Michelle had a couple here too, Victoria and Nikki going at it a little bit over Deacon Sharp. Yes, I do remember that and feeling that it was icky. But here's my absolute favorite one from Michelle, reminding us about Abby and Ashley and Stitch. That's gotta be the one that is, that has to be the most recent other mother-daughter triangle that we've had. That's a good one, completely forgot about it. Um, Michelle says, remember the time that uh, they got stuck together at the Halloween tower collapse, Halloween time tower collapse. Yes! And that was right around this time of year too. Mm. I'll tell you what though, I am really looking forward to next week. Uh, so we saw in the previews that Summer's just going to pick up right where she left off with Billy, hounding him, haranguing him to sleep with her. And then we had a preview of a scene where Phyllis is talking to a shirtless Kyle. <laughs> all about how Summer hasn't seen nothing yet. <laughs> she hasn't even seen uh, the things that mommy can really do. Monday is Labor Day, but never fear, Chatters. I have confirmed that there will still be five episodes. <laughs> so we can look forward to a full week of all of the drama and all of the chatting that you will be doing at YRChat.com. I love reading your comments, especially throughout the week as the show is unfolding. So keep them coming. Um, let's see. I guess that just about does it for me for the week, but I hope everybody has a really nice Labor Day and we will come back next Sunday and see where we are on this crazy train. <laughs> All right, everybody. I love you. Have a good week. Bye.